I bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. I hope you've had a great week. Today we get to move into Luke, and this is always exciting. This is one of those rare opportunities that we have that um, when we're coming into a religious holiday period that we won't have to switch off and what we're studying in another book uh, that's totally unrelated to, our, to um, the holidays and we'll be right here in Luke and it looks like we're just going to roll right through and um, um, it'll be we, we won't have to stop and study the Christmas story because we're studying it as we're going along. Luke begins um, historically before any other book any of the other gospels do and mentions quiet for 400 years it's been 400 years since malachi um, spoke the last time as an official messenger from god now the other night in my working with my level one students we were talking about abraham and sarah waiting for um their baby and we had a little countdown timer for 30 seconds and we were quiet for 30 seconds and that was a long time to wait but 400 years is a really long time to wait and we know that today people are has it are unhappy that we've had to stop our lives kind of just for these nine months so far of COVID we know we have a few more months but it's nothing compared to what some people have gone through so waiting, people have been waiting to hear from God. And the other thing that as the introduction, you, you um, know well that, for, that <clears throat> Luke wrote this to his friend Theopolis. And he wrote it because he knew what a difference knowing the story of Jesus had made in his life. And he believed that if you had opportunity to know the truth, then you would understand and um, you would believe it. So he wanted to give people, he wanted to give with his friend and then his, uh, then others that read it, the opportunity to know the truth about Jesus, the good news. Luke wrote uh, between his work here in, um, in Luke, the gospel, in the book of the Acts, he wrote more words than any other author. The, the, in the Bible. He is our Gentile of uh, the group that wrote the disciples. He was a physical, a, a medical doctor. And um, as a medical doctor, he is reporting from a different perspective than um, some of the other, the other disciples, other people, because he has an in inquisitive mind and he wants to know facts and details and causes and effects. And so he's going to tell the story of Jesus in a little different perspective. And, we, and it is also generally believed that Luke interviewed Mary a great deal uh, later. And so a lot of his uh, work is coming from her perspective. So as we start looking at, at the book of Luke, let me share my screen. So the title of session one is planned, uh, and I, I am still so caught up in Isaiah because I think this is one of, it was an unintentional mistake, but it is just another reminder for me. What a great, what lead and we've had. And we're going to see that our lesson today is about God preparing the way for Jesus. And if you think about it, what we've been studying in Isaiah is preparing the way for us to know here again about uh, Jesus. And, and we are just kind of picking up where we left off in Isaiah that uh, God has promised and planned these things and prophesied that they were coming. And now we're gonna see it. So our, the uh, subtitle is that God's promises point to his redemptive plan for his creation. And it's one of the things we've learned that we've seen over and over. That God's plan for creation started back in the very beginning in Genesis three, and is still moving through the ages. Here are the themes in Luke. Uh, 
theology, concern for women, and under theology, that's one of the ones, that's the one we're looking at today. And, and <clears throat> we see that under the theology themes, we're going to see about the word of God and Jesus and, and God in general, the kingdom of the present kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit. And he's gonna, you're going to stories of the concern for women. Women are often some of the um, heroines of our stories that we'll be looking at. The concern for the, rich, the poor and the rich and the differences and the concern for our social outcast. And then just in general about the Christian life. And here's the, an outline of Luke. And we're in the first, the first four books where we'll be covering them, sorry. In the first four books, we're going to be covering uh, chapters. We're covering the preparation for the ministry of Jesus. Waiting. You know, God, God uh, never acts haphazardly. His purpose directs um, his perfect plan throughout eternity. The Father's intention for salvation began back when Adam and Eve, before Adam and Eve first sinned. And this is why Jesus came to the world. And here is a, one of the amazing things. God didn't just thrust Jesus into the chaotic uh, uh, chaos of the world history, but he carefully prepared the way um, for his Messiah as he is doing today in the lesson. He's done that for us in our lives as he's prepared us, walked us through getting to the place where we could um, truly understand who he is. This narrative that we're going to talk about today is very dramatic, but for me, it's also very uh, ironic and it, it can illustrate that God has this sense of humor uh, that comes out in this. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that through through the announcement. And, we, and we're gonna see that the messages that Zechariah and then Elizabeth and Zechariah are gonna get are very, very specific about what is going to happen and what, they're gonna, what their actions are going to be. So this is Zechariah. <clears throat> he is um, serving in the temple. He did not live, he and Elizabeth did not live in Jerusalem. They lived out in a town out in Judea. But David, when he was king, set up a series of rotations of how to bring the priests from the outside um, areas in to have an opportunity to work in the temple. And this was done by uh, casting lots. They took turns of each of the different groups of priests, and then within those groups of priests, each of the priest. And what I understand is you might not ever know um, if you would actually get to serve in the temple in your lifetime. So when your name was called, it was a, um, a wonderful experience. And they, they look for an anticipation when they get the opportunity to serve. And we know Zechariah was older when this happened to him. And they would go to Jerusalem <clears throat> for a week and they would serve in the temple from one Sabbath to another Sabbath. And we know that, um, so I'm going to um, move down a few slides to just show you this so I will get it said right. And then we'll go back. All right. So Zechariah is serving in the sanctuary. And the sanctuary was between, uh, it was a holy place. And it was between the court of Israel, which the Jewish men could be in, and the most holy of holies, only the high priest entered once a year. So it was still a very, an area with very limited access. It was still a very special place to be. And it was in this part of this plan of God's all along. David set into rotation when he was king that they're still following on rotating out the service. And he's going to be serving as in a place of prayer during the evening service. And he is bringing in and he is lighting the incense. And we know that the incense is a symbolic 
of God, the prayers of the people going up to God. So he is in the sanctuary, a very holy place. Um, and he is uh, lighting the incense in it, the symbolic act of having God, the people's prayers going up to God. And so possibly he was praying also he was doing that in their lives and he and Elizabeth um, had really really wanted to have, and wanted to have children but they were both uh, now in most human terms too old to have children and so they had evidently had maybe just decided that wasn't going to be for them but it was always their prayer so we, he's in the room praying and we're going to look at uh, the first section, which is prayer answered, and it's Luke chapter 1, 13 through 15, we're looking at first. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. So one of the things that we always see is when one of the angels of the Lord appear to humans, they are always terrified. Fine. The angel are light and peaceful and bringing God's message. It evidently, from all reports, is something that makes the human step back and be afraid because they always start their message with don't be afraid. So in verse 14, there will be joy and delight for you and many will rejoice, rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and will never drink wine or beer. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit still in his mother's womb. And that promise, that last promise that he is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb is one of the reasons I have such great respect and admiration for John the Baptist. John the Baptist is one of my personal um, heroes of the faith and there are a great many but one of the reasons is that uh, is how we see this promise that john is always filled with the spirit um, lived out in his life and we'll talk about that at the end so uh, so here are some of gabriel here are not some i said that before here are gabriel's promises that he makes in these verses. Not to be afraid, their prayer has been answered. Elizabeth's gonna bear a son and they're gonna name him John. And you probably know that that was a very unusual request because in that culture, in that time period, they usually named, continued different family names and there wasn't a family name of John in that family. And so that was very unusual, but they had the name that they were supposed to give him and that um, not only were they going to have great, that they were going to have this great joy and delight. Well, we know anytime you have a baby, typically that's true. And anytime couples who, who you know have been waiting and hoping and praying to have a baby, have a baby, the, the joy and the delight just have to be even more powerful. And so many will rejoice at his birth. But, but we know that there's even more to those two, seg those two promises than what meets the eye. Because John himself is going to be the source of great joy. Many, many will be with. And that John will be great in the sight of the Lord. I think that probably every um, Christian, every Jewish parent uh, hopes and prays and believes in their child. But here is a promise that it will be true. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. And he's never going to drink wine or beer. It tells us that, um, and that tells us that um, he's going to be a Nazarite. He's gonna uh, take on those vows. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. What a wonderful, um, wonderful promise. And that promise would be a miracle, wouldn't it? Because we know, we think of that um, children 
Um, I have a difficulty understanding and accepting who, who Jesus is. That's our cultural religious thinking until they reach the age of reason. <coughs> but here we see a promise for Elizabeth and Zechariah that John is going to have the Holy Spirit. And they probably weren't even quite sure what that meant. And the Holy Spirit. And, and, and remember, they might not quite have a true concept of what that meant, at, as we do, while he was still in his mother's womb. What a great, great promise and a miracle, uh, a, 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 a seemingly miracle in itself. Make sure you miss it. So uh, I want to go back to the picture just a minute. So we, here we have Zechariah. He is ministering and lifting the prayers of the people of Israel up to God. In this special holy place, the sanctuary, probably, I know that when they went to the most holy of places and probably in this section too, they had to change their, they had to be consecrated, they had to they were supposed to change their clothes before they left to go back out into the world because their clothes were holy. Um, and so everything that happened in this area was holy. It was all concentrating on God. And yet Zechariah was astonished and frightened when he heard from God. Um, that is a pretty interesting thing we have to remember. This is all part of, of God's plan. And this is all detailed preparation for what it would mean to prepare the way for uh, our Lord and Savior. I'm sorry, I just want to make sure. So in that being delight and a joy was this picture of them jumping up and down, which was probably even a harder concept for Zechariah at his older age to envision it. It would be that much excitement. All right, so let's go on and look at 16 and 17. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah and turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous and to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. These are people that uh, uh, we're, we're still believing, still hoping, but they weren't really prepared for repentance. And we know ourselves and how we're taught to share the word that a lot of times you, you don't just start talking about the Roman road um, for the plan of salvation. That one of the key elements you have to do is that you have to prepare the way for a person. And a lot of times we do that through relational transactions. They're becoming a friend of a person to, um, and all of those things help toward preparing the way. And John had the responsibility for preparing a whole nation or the people that would listen to hear what Jesus had to say, to hear and be ready to accept him as the savior. Repentance involves a changed mind and heart that lead to um, different actions characterized the Lord. And so that is what John is gonna have to instill. Um, and he is doing that to the children of Israel because they were going to come first. It says in 17 that he's going to be uh, come before him in the power and spirit of Elijah. And many people often interpret that to mean through the years, they interpreted that to mean that Elijah, who never died, would be brought back to the earth alive and preach in his own 
and preach himself. But, you know, here in our version, in the Christian standard version, it clearly says he will go before him in the spirit and power. So it's not Elijah himself, but coming in the spirit and the, and the power uh, of Elijah, like an Elijah. And I know, uh, for me, the story of Elijah and uh, the day that he stood and confronted the 450 um, prophets of Baal, I, I'm, I'm just always amazed at what he was able to do that day and how he kept his calm and reassurance in that time period. So I want to go to the next slide and just see, um, these are the things that um, the angel is telling them that John's mission is going to be. And so I just think it's kind of interesting. I, I happen to be watching The Crown right now. And um, in, in The Crown, Queen Elizabeth was born to be queen. Now she thought through a lot, through a lot of her early, early life, and even when she and Philip married, that they, she might not ever be queen um, because her father wasn't king at the time, her uncle was. And uh, so she, she had the potential of that, but not knowing it. But then once it was forced upon her that she was queen, it changed their lives dramatically. And it wasn't a life she chose for herself. It was a life that was um, laid out before her. And so on one hand, it might seem like a really good thing to know what to be given before your child was born. Here's what they're gonna, their mission's gonna be, but sometimes it's very limiting. But we know here it's a blessing in that um, I think that through what we see in John's life, that somehow Zechariah and Elizabeth were able to teach him because he had the Holy Spirit in him uh, in a way that he was able to fulfill his mission. And that, that, that was the only thing he ever thought about doing. And his mission is a message of repentance, that he's going to turn the people of Israel back to the Lord, not just going through their routine emotions of going to the temple, but a true turning back to understanding and loving who God is. He's going to be able to preach in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And while we don't have a whole lot of his messages, and I don't know, sometimes I wonder that the only thing he ever said was repent. Um, Peter seemed to do pretty well with that in the early days of Pentecost. Uh, so sometimes we might not need a lot of flowery talk, but just being drawn back to the true message. And he's gonna turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. I have a friend who um, has a 21 year old son. And for a lot of different reasons, he rebelled at 14. And she has just had a difficult time with him from the moment he started on, on this different track. Now, she's had him, uh, it's not that, that he was unchurched, or, um, but he, he did lose his father to cancer at an early age and that maybe impacted him. <clears throat> but from 15 till just recently, uh, he was a very troubled, young man and we've been praying with her uh, for this situation for six years and he's just completed uh, a, a multi-month stay in rehab and she got to pick him up this week and to take him on to there's an uh, to the next kind of um, guided portion of this treatment and she told us that I had my 14, she said, I have my 14 year old son back in an adult body. It's a miracle of God. And it is the hearts of the fathers being turned back to their children. But in this way, it's the children turning back. But that is what the power of God's word can do. And it's going to turn the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous. And it's going to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. so we want to not we want to realize we're dealing with an all-powerful god and not just continue to look through the world and the lives of humans which we do a lot
<clears throat> so um, it also, we see these messianic prophecies fulfilled in this, these few scriptures that there, Elijah would prepare the way for the Lord. Malachi to clear the way. In Isaiah 43 through 5, it said, prepare the way. In Malachi 4, 5 through 6, it turn the children back to their fathers. Disobedience, disobedience into understanding. And we are watching fulfillment of prophecy being laid out here. God is working about bringing his redemptive plan. Uh, just as God prepared Zechariah that he and Elizabeth could prepare for raising John, he used John to way, the, a way to prepare for an even greater part of his plan, the birth of his son. So how have you ever considered the way God works out his plans through answers to your prayers? And how can we cooperate with God to see his plans in the future? So uh, one of the things I would encourage uh, you about learning to cooperate with God is that if, if you have not read uh, Henry Blackaby's experience in God, it came out in the eighties. Um, there is a Bible study and we, I've done it. I went through a couple of different years, but, uh, and it's very powerful, but Henry has also written two books on experiencing God and, um, it, that opened my eyes for, her, for how, how I could watch for where God was at work. That's what I had to do. I have to watch for where God is at work. And then I can join in on his mission. So God prepared, and that's what I just talked about. So, um, right. All right. So now we're going to doubt it's expressed in uh, 18 through 21. So Zezekiah says, remember, he's supposed to be in this part of area about praying. How can I know this? Zechariah asked the angel. For I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Now, isn't that a such a gracious statement by Zechariah? He says he's an old man, but he uses he covers these words about Elizabeth. She's well along in age, not quite saying she's an old woman. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and tell you the good this good news. Now listen. You will become silent and able to speak until the day these things happen because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Okay, so what we see here is that Isaiah, I mean, Isaiah, Zechariah is going to ask for a sign. And that is in this verse right here, in 18. When he says, how can I know this? He's asking for a sign, which is not always the best thing to do. It, it's always an okay thing to do, but you better be prepared for, for the sign. Um, and it's, and it really is, it's not just about, um, it's not about sexual just help. This is about, oh, wow, how is this gonna happen, okay? Um, so let's look at this. Here we see some messages about Gabriel, some information we see about Gabriel. He, he stands, he's there standing in the presence of God. So he is a representative of God. He is someone that has ongoing access to God. He's only one of two angels named in the Bible. So we know there are, there are a multitude of angels, but we only know two named angels, Gabriel and Michael. So that it gives us an indication that he's pretty important to God, that he has been sent by God to speak and tell, delivering these messages. And because of that, you should pay attention to him. So Zechariah has doubts. Um, and, and, he, and because he has those doubts, 
he had to pay a penalty. And that penalty in this case was that he wouldn't be able to speak until the day this takes place. So <clears throat> what we have to always know, what this section is going to teach us, God has the power to do what he says he will do. Um, so Gabriel hasn't come on his own initiative. He's been sent by God. Um, and um, he needs to entrust himself to what God was telling him. So Zechariah gets to become a living object lesson. Sometimes I felt like I was at a living object lesson, not to as many people as Zechariah. Um, and John are going to be, but you know, things happen in my life. And that's part, I think, of how we connect with God is watching for when we are in a place of being a living example. All right, so he can't speak when he comes out. And it's going to be a while before he can. So here's the picture we have to look at. Yeah, right. So for every day, for more than nine months, Zechariah is reminded um, of his doubt. And that was probably a pretty powerful lesson for him. <clears throat> but the fact that he was silent was a sign of God's promise that it was going to come true. And he could only look forward quietly to what the angel had said the day that it was fulfilled in the proper time. Um, we have to entrust ourselves to God's plan. He loves us and he wants what's best for us. And as we accept his will and set us aside our lack of faith, we will experience his powerful hand in our lives. And that's what we can trust in right now. Don't we need to know that? That uh, our lives are in um, the power of God's hand. So what kind of circumstances have caused you to trust God's promises? And how would immersion, immersion in the scriptures help us to under trust God with our lives? It helps me every day, and I hope it does too, that, I, that scriptures are... Um, I, I recall scriptures that just fit in with what is happening to me and finding trust and hope in them. All right, so now Zechariah has been in this area for a long time and nobody knows longer than usual. And nobody knows what's happening in the room. And they're all a little bit concerned, but they have a sense because he's been in there so long, it's just the hour of prayer that maybe he's seen a vision from God. So they are all standing out <clears throat> outside, anticipating an eager anticipation of what he's going to come out and tell them that he heard or that he saw. And he comes out and he can't even talk. This is a really um, strange experience for everybody. Well, in our next section, <clears throat> reality scene in 21, and we're going to look at 21 through 23 first. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He was making signs in, to them and remained speechless. And when the days of his ministry were complete, he went back home. All right, so he's been given this, he's had this tremendous experience of meeting Gabriel and hearing these good news. Now, you know, some people would would have to go, oh no, I have to go home and sit down and think about this, or I need to go back and be with Elizabeth so I can fulfill God's plan. But <clears throat> he didn't do that. He stayed in Jerusalem. He worked every day until the days of his ministry was complete before he returned and went back home. He was faithful to his assignments, to the work he had been given for God. And so this is what we talked about earlier, the things about what he was doing in the sanctuary. <clears throat> so verses 24 and 25. 
And this is where I see where God is uh, concerned for women. After these days, his wife, Elizabeth, so he's gone back now. We don't know exactly how long it is after he gets back. And let me just say this. Um, of course, he can't really, he can't talk to Elizabeth either. Now, in the commentary, it said that he, because we know that when they're back in the temple to consecrate John, that he wrote out that he wanted the boy named John. So some um, commentaries believe that he wrote out to give this message to Elizabeth. But I think that might be pushing it a little bit um, because as far as we can tell that women couldn't read um, in those days, they weren't taught to read. So unless they brought someone else in to interpret the reading, uh, what John was writing for, and maybe they had to, so that she could know to go get eggs or whatever. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure, but he had to communicate once again with his sign language. And you know, if, if you watch the, when we have the signing in our church, uh, I've taken six weeks of sign language. Uh, it is very hard to follow when with an established sign language. So he is making it up. So I'm sure it was very uh, difficult time, um, but the message got across. So after some time, Elizabeth conceived and then she kept herself in seclusion for five months. So not only is Zachariah not speaking, but Elizabeth has disappeared for five months. And it's generally thought that maybe she wanted to wait until it was obvious she was pregnant so they wouldn't have to you know, if she went around telling people I'm going to be pregnant, they might have thought that she was being delusional. So, but for whatever reason, she kept herself um, in seclusion for five months. Now, I would tell you, this is my opinion, but because of we, how we know that John turned out, I, I am wondering if uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth didn't spend a lot of this first five months, if not the whole nine months in a great deal of meditation and prayer about how they were gonna raise this boy to be able to do God's mission. And that wouldn't surprise me knowing who Elizabeth and John uh, and Zechariah were, were as um, their characters, but we certainly see that they were successful in doing that in the life of John the Baptist. And in 25, um, we know that she is going to be talking, that this is Elizabeth speaking because she said um, in th these great words, this, the Lord has done this for me. So she makes it very personal that what has happened, he did it for her. And um, the guy said out in the desert, he is the God who sees me. And um, she is saying that now, and that he's looked favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. And, and we know in that cultural time, it was a disgrace not to have children, but it's still that, uh, that disgrace is still true today. Um, and because we know how hard it is for couples who are childless uh, and how the mental health can suffer, uh, and especially for the woman in those circumstances, even today. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so let's just think for a moment here and stop and think. Abraham and Sarah also faced these kind of this kind of situation. And what did they do when they were told they were going to have a child at 99, I think 79 or 89? They both laughed. God was a little bit more merciful to them because he kept telling them that there was a little bit different setup and purposes. But they had trouble, but they got it. And that both of them felt the same way. There is the story of um, Samson's parents. Uh, uh, it, Samson's parents in um, Judges 11, I believe. And they were given, they were in the same boat. They couldn't conceive. And they were told that they would have a child and he would have these special characteristics. Um, and very similar about being in Nazareth and uh, given um, very details on what they were supposed to do. But you know, Samson didn't quite turn out um, like John the Baptist. He had his high moments, but he also had moments he failed. 
And then there's Hannah and her husband, who I believe was a priest too. And now in Hannah's story, her husband's not um, vocal as much and we don't see as much about him, but Hannah's pleadings were very much similar. And, and, what, and what was she able to do? When, when she had Samuel, she gave Samuel back to the Lord. Always another one of those amazing stories where she took him um, when he was weaned and, um, uh, and gave him to, um, to Eli. Uh, a, a child that she had prayed for for so long. And when he was finally given to her, she gave him back to, in a very physical way, gave him back to the Lord. And so Elizabeth is uh, saying these things to that God has favor on me. And she is recognizing in these words that every blessing comes from God. And that is our key doctrine for today. So we see here that Elizabeth is acknowledging that the Lord answered her prayers, God's favor, and that he kept his promise. And our key doctrine today is stewardship, that God is the source of all blessings, temporal and spiritual, and all that we have and are we owe to him. And there's a verse in Deuteronomy. And so we see that Zechariah and Elizabeth are going to, are going to give John back to God, and they are able to raise him in a way that he fulfills um, the messages. He fulfills what God has intended him to do, which is an amazing thing. Of course, the reason he ever would do that is because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So let me just go back to that for just a moment. So I'm going to go back to the very beginning. And this promise. So and the promise that he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. And this is one of the reasons that, as I said, that John the Baptist is a hero of faith for me. So I wanted to read to you um, the last part section of um, Luke 1. Okay, let me put on my reading glasses. So this is verses 39 um, through 41. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country. This is after Mary has had the message with um, the message from um, Gabriel that she is going to conceive and she evidently has conceived. So she, uh, in verse 39, in those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby inside of her left, inside of her, the baby leaped inside of her and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So I've always envisioned this, that at this moment, while John was still in the womb because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he leaped at the present, he, he, he leaped in the womb at the presence of Jesus being in his mother's room, womb in the room. And you could think of that, I think of that as even at this such an early moment, John was pointing Elizabeth to her savior. And Elizabeth, because of that, was filled with the Holy Spirit. That from before the time John the Baptist was born, he was pointing people to Jesus, just like he did when Andrew and one of the other disciples were just being his disciples and were always asking questions about the Lamb of God and Jesus happened to walk by and John said, there's the Lamb of God. That's the kind of person I'd like to be. I would like to always be pointing people to Jesus in my life, like John the Baptist. And we know that <clears throat> as John's ministry uh, increased, as John, I'm sorry, as Jesus was ready to begin his ministry, John took a step back. Now Herod helped out in that equation, but I believe that that would have been John's plan all along, that he would put, always put Jesus in the spotlight. Now he might not have, he might not have ever known how that was going to happen. He might have wondered and prayed about that, um, and God worked out a way for that to happen. But because he got 
I was imprisoned. You didn't get to see Jesus work, see him personally do the miracles. It wasn't that he didn't doubt. But he had that moment that he sent his disciples very close to the end of his life and said, is it true? Are you the one? And Jesus was able to send back the message. Tell him. The blind walk, the blind see, and the lame walk. So John, even in his great belief and his great mission, didn't get to, even though he knew who Jesus was and he knew he was the Lamb of God, he didn't really get to see the full fulfillment of who Jesus was. He just always had to take um, that on faith, much like you and I do. And, and once again, we might even have more insight because we have the whole body of scripture. So um, <clears throat> I think we're at the end. So what are your typical reactions to God's promises and what does it take to turn your doubts into the acceptance of God's reality? Let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for providing a way for salvation to everyone who believes in, chooses to put their faith in you. And we are just so grateful you made Jesus real in our life. We are so grateful how you've kept your hand over us in these days. And just help us in every way we can to find ways that we can point um, the people we care for and love and the people around us to your son. And then this week, go with us in safety and protection. Um, and we want to pray for our family members and our church members and our community at this time, that you will once again keep your hedge of protection, make people wise in the decisions they're making, and bring us back safely next week. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.